Good afternoon. I know, I know it's late for some and mid afternoon for others. My name is Sarai Cook and we are going to have a webinar on how emerging funding strategies can help tribal nations support child and youth programs. And to get us started today, we have our CEO, Elizabeth Gaines, who will start us out with this webinar for today. And then I'll introduce myself a little bit more later on. Great, thanks Sarai. And I just have to say, um, we are, we are so grateful that Sarai Cook has joined us as a senior fellow at, at Children's Funding Project. The amount of energy and enthusiasm for really not only educating our team internally about the flow of funding streams um, and sort of the, the unique um, circumstances of governance related to tribal funding, um, but, but also then helping us to build out the work that Children's Funding Project does in ways that are useful to um, tribal nations. So really excited about this, really excited about the partnership, Jennifer, with, with you all, and you can introduce yourself in just a second. But before we have you do that and get into the, the specifics of the panel, Sarai had just sort of asked me to share a little bit about why Children's Funding Project exists. And I, when we were having the conversation and I was sort of explaining to her where I come from and why this is so important to me, it starts with my experience 20, 25, some almost 30 years ago now um, as an after school program provider. And really the experience of knowing we had a really Im impressive and, and high quality uh, program that, that kids were accessing. And we had other kids in the neighborhood or siblings or what have you that were coming up to me on a regular basis saying, can I get in safe haven? And I'd have to tell them no, because there was never enough money. There weren't enough resources to meet the needs of all the kids that wanted to change their life trajectory. Um, and so, you know, that was one moment in time for me. Then I went on to um, really engage in state advocacy in my home state of Missouri. And we were trying to get the tobacco settlement. If folks are old enough, they might remember the, the tobacco settlement days where there was this windfall to um, states and legislatures were deciding where to spend it. And I, of course, was trying to get them to spend it on child and youth development. Well, they asked me, they'd say, well, what are we currently spending on child and youth development? And I had no earthly idea because it's spread, all the money that we spend on kids is spread across in that state at the time, eight different state departments and agencies, right? So, you know, just to give you an example, there were seven different state agencies that had a line item for youth mentoring. Well, you know, I was, I was an advocate. I was trying to do my best to sort of track all that. So that was sort of a Another moment that said, wait a minute, you know, what, what are we doing here on the financing side of things? And then I will say, you know, so we went and did this fiscal mapping and really laid it all out for them and said, here's what we're spending on positive, like asset building opportunities for young people. And here's what we're spending on deep end intervention once young people have gotten into trouble or have, you know, are in crisis. Um, and then, you know, I, I would say we also as advocates often will go and ask for much less than what is actually needed to serve and meet the needs of our of our kiddos. And so we, you know, really need to be telling policymakers the true cost of doing things, um, hence our focus on cost modeling. And, and we did a previous webinar on that. And then I will just um, end with, you know, the point that Olivia and I began, and Olivia Allen is in the participant list here, so she'll be chatting, I'm sure, at folks as we go through this. But we began Children's Funding Project to explore, you know, how can we actually help our field infuse more money into the systems for kids that we know are going to change their lives? And what are other fields doing to get more access to money? <laughs> and so we kind of came to this ballot measures thing. We came to the, the set of emerging funding streams that we're going to talk about today or emerging funding strategies, really, I should say. Um, so super excited for this webinar. Um, we, we are excited to share what we've been learning about that. And I will be quiet and we can jump to um, the work. But Sarai, is that, is that sort of what we wanted to start with? You're muted. <laughs> I really just wanted to, to show our intentions for this conversation. And I think that really, you did a really nice job of helping people to understand the holistically what, what the vision is and what our intentions are for the work that we're doing. So thank you very much. And next we'll have Jennifer um, say a few things. 
Hi, everyone. Thank you. thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you, Sarai. My name is Jennifer Ratcliffe. I'm the Executive Director of the National Indian Child Care Association. Our organization is um, a capacity building and advocacy organization that supports tribal child care programs all across the country. There are 268 uh, tribal child care programs um, serving the 560 some odd tribes that we have across this, the nation. Um, and we work with programs who are explicitly receiving the Child Care and Development Fund grants, as well as um, tribes who are just interested in it, in expanding their own early learning programs. And that is um, kind of a growing area um, for tribal programs where they're expo exploring what that looks like without um, going through federal funding streams. So um, I am super excited to be partnering with the Children's Funding Project because of the timing of this um, and the space that we're sitting in. So I think probably most of you are very aware about the funding that has the federal funding that has come down through the early learning streams, particularly during COVID and how to respond to the impacts that COVID had. Um, so we're sitting at a space right now where there is a lot of financial resources um, to available for us and um, to, to grow and to strengthen what our current programs look like, but we are kind of sitting in a spot that is very apropos to today's conversation of we are seeing the end of this um, funding stream and we need to figure out where, how do we continue supporting the programs that we've created and the programs that we've built um, that are supporting families during, you know, high stress and high trauma, um, because that doesn't go away as quickly as the funding does. So <clears throat> I just want to kind of briefly, you can see on the slide, the, the previous webinars, and I put in the chat, these, both of these um, previous webinars were phenomenal. And this is sort of the third um, part of that, the third leg of the stool, um, to really think about where, where do we go from here and what are the opportunities for us that are out there to continue funding the services that we um, we sort of grown grown to or we wish to grow to um, in this new era. So I am super excited to have partnered with the Children's Funding Project on this um, and to have our panelists here today. So thank you all to the panelists and thank you all to you all on the phone for your time. And I'm looking forward to learning alongside you. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you so much for being an, an excellent partner in, in this programming, and we really appreciate you. Again, my name is Sarai Cook. I am a senior fellow with the Children's Funding Project. Today, we will hear from our team um, here at the Children's Funding Project. Uh, we're, we are the team that's doing the research around these emerging funding strategies. We're putting together information fact sheets, which you'll be able to find on our website for different funding sources. And we're also making connections to technical assistance providers. So each one of these funding strategies that we research, we also, we write a one pager on it. And then we also find people that can provide technical assistance for these resources. So if you read one of our, our funding sheets and are interested, we can then connect you with someone in that industry that can assist you with that process. Courtney Moore is heading up this research and she'll be doing most of the presenting today. And then our CEO, Elizabeth Gaines, will also join us later for our panel discussion. We have invited some panelists. Uh, we've invited Alvin Warren, who is the Vice President of Career Pathways and Advocacy for the Los Alamos National Lab Foundation. Alvin will discuss collaborative efforts between Pueblos, tribes, and tribal nations with the state of New Mexico that will help bring more funding to children. Um, we also have Douglas Goh and Townsend Hyatt, who are both partners at Oric Public Financing. Douglas and Townsend will discuss bond financing for child and youth capital projects. As we progress through the presentation, each guest will discuss their knowledge and experience with various funding strategies. So thank you very much to our panelists for agreeing to join us for this webinar. We really appreciate you and we'll kick it off with Courtney discussing our Cradle to Career Pipeline. Yeah, thank you so much, Sarai. Um, 
everyone, we will definitely be jumping into some of those emerging funding sources. But first, I just wanted to take a quick step back and talk about strategic public financing. Um, it's a process that I think is really helpful to discuss up front since it's going to help with a lot of the framing for the conversation moving forward. Um, at CFP, we've done a lot of work in the early childhood space, but really we're vested in the cradle to career pipeline. So that goes from early childhood through work and career. Um, and as we do that, we're tasked with identifying the people, groups, and institutions that act as drivers within that system, as well as to consider those overlying factors that influence it. Um, I think we've seen that across the pipeline, there is going to be resource gaps that exist. And those resource gaps are not necessarily just financial um, or funding related, though that's a huge part of it. Um, you can also see resource gaps with the people that work within the system and keep it going, um, data that's used to show what is and is not working. And so as an organization, we're definitely challenged to find ways to fill those resource gaps. And ultimately, I think that is where strategic public financing starts to come into play. We look at it as a process that allows states, tribes, and communities to one, assigned a cost to child and youth related goals and policy priorities, and then two, to identify ways to cover those costs. We typically break those out into three main steps. So the first is current funding. And essentially we use fiscal mapping as a tool to see what current investments into child and youth services and programming looks like. We also look at true costs. Um, so the tool we use for that is cost modeling and cost estimation. Um, and again, that identifies um, how much money we actually need to make sure we have high quality optimal services. And then the last bucket really surrounds revenue and funding research. Um, and essentially that ends up bridging the gap between what we have and what we know we have for current investments and then what we actually need for full funding. Uh, as Elizabeth mentioned earlier, webinars in this series took a deeper dive into fiscal mapping and cost modeling. So for us today, when we talk about emerging funding strategies, that really fits into that, that third step looking at new funding sources. I wanna quickly highlight some work we did um, in San Antonio and Bear County, Texas. I think it's one of our best examples of strategic public financing in action. Essentially, this was a three-year project that we did in collaboration with UP Partnership, which is a local nonprofit organization based in San Antonio. And in the first year, the focus was on the development of a fiscal map, uh, ultimately with the intention of developing a helpful landscape of how much funding was flowing towards youth in the city. And then in the second year, a youth-led alignment task force was established. And I'd say one of the, the main priorities and goals of that task force was to be able to identify um, some spending goals for youth. And then in the final year, so year three, CFP worked with UP Partnership, and again, in collaboration with some consultants from PFM, and essentially translate those goals and priorities from that alignment task force into concrete spending recommendations um, that would be supported by American Rescue Plan dollars. So in terms of sort of like the research process for that, uh, there was components of cost estimation, as well as funding research that really focused on federal relief dollars. Uh, it ended up being a huge win for folks out in San Antonio. The city went on to allocate $10 million of their local fiscal recovery fund dollars under the American Rescue Plan Act to youth services. Um, I know last time I checked in mid-October, it still seemed like they were in in the process of determining specific plans for that 10 million, uh, but it's already been earmarked, which was amazing. Um, and then on top of that 10 million, there was an additional $15 million also from the local fiscal recovery funds that was going to go towards youth mental health services. 
Uh, so once again, it was a huge win for advocates and is just a great example, um, just showing the progression of the strategic public financing process. Um, I will say as the big disclaimer, uh, outcomes for strategic public financing really do vary depending on the context that we're working in. So depending on what the goals of your tribe are, um, that would really influence what the process unfolds as. Now we can start getting into some of those specific um, revenue and funding sources, uh, which is why you're all here. This table um, essentially lists out some of the common or go-to funding sources that we typically see for tribes. And then on the right, there's are those that we consider emerging. Um, so they're not going to be universally used. They tend to be a little bit more out of the box. Um, but we've seen them being implemented to support children and youth across the country. Um, and of course, depending on your context, they may be feasible for you to um, really sort of pursue within um, your cities and your areas. Um, the ones that are highlighted with the yellow and have the asterisk are going to be the ones that we're talking about today. Um, so you can expect to hear a little bit more about those. And then some of those other options are ones that we currently have on our radar and we're building out resources for them, um, but we're, we're not focusing on those ones today. This slide is um, just another visual uh, to really look at how we can compare those different funding sources to one another. Um, essentially, it looks at their difficulty to implement measured up against their impact within the community. And the general trend here is as the difficulty implements it, um, or as the difficulty increases, the impact it can potentially have within your community also increases. Um, we've listed out some factors to consider when deciding on which funding sources makes the most to makes the most sense to pursue. Um, there are things that we haven't included here, um, but they range from the amount of money generated to additional stakeholders and partners that need to be at the table for negotiation. So again, really um, underscoring that this is some, but not all of the components to think about. Our big jumping off point and the first source we'll cover our voter approved children's funds. This is really where CFP's expertise lies. Um, and when I say voter approved children's funds, I am referring to local public revenue that's dedicated to children's services in an election by voters. So this map we have here shows all of the localities across the country that currently have uh, voter approved children's funds in operation. I wanna say there are about 48 um, and they bring in just about $1.4 billion annually to support children and youth. Um, so collectively it's a, it's a big impact. Um, and there are also ways that tribes can get involved and support the work of voter approved children's funds. Uh, on the call, I know we have Alvin, um, who's doing some really great work on a constitutional amendment out in New Mexico. Um, so Warren, I wanted to turn it over to you to tell us a little bit more about those efforts and how Native nations have supported this work. Sure. Well, um, my name is Alvin Warren. I'm from Santa Clara Pueblo. Uh, I work for the Lano Foundation, which is a regional foundation. Uh, I do want to clarify, this is not work that we are leading in any way, but I'm happy to share what's happening in our home state. Um, I know we have folks actually on this call who are doing very active work. So I want to recognize Jacob V. Hill with uh, New Mexico Voices for Children. Um, so what's happening here in New Mexico that I think should be very interesting to um, tribal nations around the country is that we're voting on a proposed amendment to our state constitution. And specifically, um, if that amendment passes, it would take more money out of our state's $25.5 billion land grant permanent fund and spend it on a variety of purposes, including um, early childhood education and K-12 education. Um, by my count, hopefully, Jacob, I'm getting this right, it would increase the fund distribution by about 1.25%. Um, 
And the projections for that are around 125 million in pre-K and up to 75 million in K-12 programs each year. So I'm not the only one in New Mexico who feels that it's essential for tribal nations and native communities to benefit equitably from this fund. First, the fund is actually derived from tens of millions of acres, um, over 10 millions of acres of land granted from the United States to the state of New Mexico under something called the Ferguson Act of 1898 and, the, and our own States Enabling Act of 1910. So put a different way, this is revenue derived from stolen tribal land. Let's all be very clear about that. Uh, number two, in 2018, um, a judge here in New Mexico, Sarah Singleton, ruled in a case, the consolidated Martinez Yazi versus New Mexico case, that the state of New Mexico has failed to provide an adequate public education to students who are Native American, who are living with disabilities, who are learning English as a second language, and who come from families with low incomes. So what we have is a, a, a huge chunk of money that comes from stolen lands and a failure on the part of our state to adequately provide educational um, support and services to Native students. That seems like a perfect recipe for a, a fund that that not only benefits native people and tribes, but then is something that we would want to support. And that's exactly what's happening right now um, is we have a number of folks from tribal leaders to native nonprofit folks who are advocating very strongly for this proposed amendment. Um, we have folks like the All Pueblo Council of Governors, which is the, the consortia of the 19 Pueblos of New Mexico and one Pueblo in Texas that have adopted um, a resolution to support this. We have an organization here um, called Native Vote, um, New Mexico Native Vote, that is actively um, um, implementing a campaign right now to encourage Native voters um, across the state to support this constitutional amendment. What's exciting about this, um, and I'll leave it here, is that um, this is in the context of efforts that are not just limited to this permanent fund, but are focused, a multi-year effort focused on um, creating significant uh, mechanisms for tribes to access state funding and federal funding that flows through the state of New Mexico to improve educational outcomes for students. And when it comes back around to me, I might talk about some of these other efforts. But for those who are listening, it's an important reminder to us, and I'm a former tribal leader, I'm a former Lieutenant Governor of my tribe, I'm also a former cabinet secretary of Indian Affairs for the state of New Mexico. So I've made this argument from both sides as a tribal leader and as a state leader. State governments need to do more to make funding available and accessible to tribes because tribal citizens like me, we're tribal citizens, but we're also state citizens and state residents. And our states unfortunately put up far too many obstacles for us to access those resources in our communities. We have phenomenal things happening in our state around early childhood, things like the Karis Children's Learning Center, the Walla Toa um, Head Start, which is a full Karis, uh, a full Toa language immersion school. Um, I am on the board of two different tribally controlled schools here, the Papo Community School and on the board of trustees for the Santa Fe Indian School. We have the models, they are the right fit for us. We need the resources to be able to implement those. And I know that's true across Indian country and across indigenous communities. So I'm excited to share more about this as we move forward. Yeah, thank you so much for providing that additional context, Alvin. Um, and we'll definitely use some of that Q&A portion and panel discussion to talk more about it. Um, next up, we can chat a little bit more about in-kind facilities usage. Um, this would be a way for tribal governments to support local organizations by offering facilities and other resources at free or reduced costs. So these other resources can be things like transportation and staffing support. I'd say of all of the examples that we'll cover today, this one is going to be the easiest to implement, and part of that is because it is low cost. Um, but keep in mind um, that generally speaking, in-kind facilities usage can only really support limited purposes. So you wouldn't be able to use it to fund early learning slots or things like professional development. Um, so in that sense, it is very, very specific. Um, Jennifer, I know you had uh, some knowledge about things happening in Meskwaki Nation that involved in-kind facilities usage. So um, 
yeah, you can feel free to chime in and share some more details about that. Yeah, so we work with um, tribes across the country who are, like I said previously, building up their um, early care and education systems. And one of the tribes that we are working with is out of the state of Iowa, and they are um, <clears throat> developing and constructing a state-of-the-art community center um, <clears throat> millions and millions of dollars that the tribe is um, is putting into this facility that's going to house a vast number of things from a community center to um, <clears throat> a wellness center. I think there's some health aspects to it. <clears throat> Sorry. And a as well as a child care facility. So the tribe is funding and financing the child care facility itself. They do. This tribe does get CCDF funding. Um, but their CCDF funding is not going towards the construction of this um, this site. It's um, they will continue just sort of running the services with their funding. Um, but the tribe is supporting the the child care facility within this larger structure. And um, one of the other, I, I know lots of other tribes are kind of embarking on this as well. And looking at um, one of the one of the things that we had at our last conference uh, just a few weeks ago was how we can start start thinking about this co-location of services in a way that supports our early learning um, communities and the growth of that within our communities. Um, so, you know, how do we leverage, as we're talking about today, leverage resources that support um, the the development of wellness facilities or police stations or things like that, that we can also utilize and create spaces for early learning. Um, so there's a there's a lot of opportunity for this. Um, and as I'm speaking today, I know I've had conversations with um, CFP in the past about what, what this looks like. And I just thought of some new other funding streams that kind of support this line of talking, um, which is through the um, ICDBG, the Indian Child Development Block Grant, um, and other HUD funding streams. But um, this is happening, I think, uh, in many, many places. And it's it, it's a great way to for tribes to really start taking on um, their own early learning services. And I think this sort of opens the, opens the door for what this looks like for um, them creating spaces even outside of this federal funding stream, the federal funding streams that we have, so. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that, Jennifer. Um, we can move on to tax exempt bonds. Um, I know typically I've seen this written about as tribal economic development bonds or TED bonds, um, but essentially they allow tribes to pursue tax exempt borrowing to cover really a range of community based investments. I know Doug and Town Center really are bond experts on the call. Um, so I wanted to turn it over to the two of you um, to see if you could talk a little bit more about what possible bond options exist to support children and youth programming and infrastructure, um, as well as how folks can go about learning more about those different bond types. Uh, well, thank you, Courtney. <clears throat> um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Townsend Hyatt. I'm going to um, make some observations. Doug and I are going to sort of share this presentation, and I'm going to make some observations about bonds issued by tribal governments, and then Doug will speak to bonds issued by uh, uh, by or for uh, nonprofit corporations that may serve tribal constituencies. Um, bonds are really just a form of borrowing uh, that generally have a longer term than a commercial loan. For example, uh, bonds may uh, last or be outstanding for 15 to 30 years, whereas a loan is typically more like five to seven years. So it's a shorter repayment horizon. And the reason that bonds can be useful to governmental entities is because it allows them to spread the costs of financing over many years rather than cramming repayment into a shorter period of time. And that helps you pay for some of these uh, facilities that we're talking about um, over their, their useful lives. Um, so bonds issued by governmental entities, including Indian tribal governments, uh, have some advantages. Uh, specifically, 
governmental bonds enjoy lower borrowing costs if they qualify for tax exempt treatment. And this lower cost is due to the fact that when investors don't pay taxes on the interest that they earn, they're willing to charge a lower rate of interest because their effective rate of return is the same. And the, the difference between um, taxable versus tax exempt rates varies, uh, but a difference of 2% or 200 basis points uh, wouldn't be unheard of. And depending on how much you're borrowing and for how long, that, that can add up to you know, real money uh, over the years. Um, tribes can issue tax exempt bonds if the purpose for which they're bonding is uh, an essential governmental function. And that means functions that state and local governments with general taxing powers typically borrow for. Um, essential governmental functions uh, do not include projects that are uh, used by or secured uh, or paid for by private parties, so-called private activity bonds. And Doug's gonna speak more to that in, in just a minute. Um, as Courtney mentioned, there's this other category of bonds called TED bonds, which we can talk about during the discussion if folks are interested, but those are, are generally used for commercial purposes, commercial product uh, projects, excuse me, rather than governmental. Um, projects. But for tribally owned and operated um, children's and youth facilities, such as schools, uh, daycare, parks and recreational facilities, uh, wellness centers, etc., essential governmental function tax exempt borrowing is, is probably more the norm. Um, and for tribes considering tax exempt bonds, there's a number of practical uh, considerations uh, as well, such as most particularly, how are we going to pay for it? Um, are we pledging certain collateral? Is this a, a general obligation of the tribe or is it a, a limited recourse obligation where it's repayable only from certain types of uh, revenues or, or program monies or whatever? Um, if you're borrowing, are, are bonds the best option? Uh, sometimes I mention the difference between bonds and loans in terms of um, tenure, but um, in some cases, a loan may actually be the better option. So uh, in, in some circumstances, a loan may suffice. Um, what types of tribal laws affect our ability uh, to borrow, such as does the tribe have debt limits? Um, are there specific authorizations uh, from tribal council or from certain agencies within the tribe that uh, are required for um, the borrowing to be valid. Um, how do we resolve disputes? Is there a waiver of sovereign immunity? And if so, how do we limit that in a way to protect the tribe and its assets? Um, in my own experience working on uh, tribal youth centers, schools, uh, and so forth, we have generally seen these done as um, general obligation bonds, although sometimes they are backed by um, specific revenues of some other tribal enterprise. Uh, but in most cases, these facilities, they don't produce revenues on their own, so they don't really uh, operate as a standalone borrowing. Um, but that's not the only way to pay for these uh, these facilities and projects. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Doug to cover the other side. Uh, great. Th <laughs> Thank you, Townsend, for that excellent overview of, uh, of tax exempt financing uh, issued by the tribe itself. And uh, Courtney and Elizabeth, we appreciate the opportunity to, to address this really important uh, project. As Townsend said, I'm going to, we see across the country, both for tribal project as well as other um, children's projects in local communities and states, uh, nonprofits uh, using the tax code uh, to borrow money for 
uh, child, uh, uh, whether those be youth and recreation centers or early childhood learning centers or, you know, adjuncts to school facilities. And under the tax code, um, what we refer to as 501c3 organizations, those are nonprofits that have obtained a what's called a, a determination letter from the Internal Revenue Services that says they're a, a federally recognized nonprofit. Those entities, while they can't directly issue bonds and uh, borrow, if they <clears throat> work with a state or local government uh, to issue bonds on their behalf, uh, can borrow uh, bonds on a, the same sort of favorable terms that uh, Townsend has outlined for tribes. And virtually every state has both a statewide issuer that issues bonds for nonprofits. For example, we've been, uh, had that great presentation by Alvin about the New Mexico situation. The New Mexico Finance Authority would be an example of an, uh, a statewide entity that could issue tax exempt bonds on behalf of a local uh, nonprofit uh, engaged in uh, supporting our children and youth. Uh, Likewise, there in many states, there are local so-called conduit finance authorities that issue, whose sole purpose is to issue bonds um, on behalf of uh, nonprofit organizations, including uh, children and youth focused uh, nonprofits. And <clears throat> just as with, uh, as Townsend pointed out, um, whether it's a um, denominated as a bond or a loan and you want to get that tax exempt interest rate, you still have to figure out a, how is the nonprofit uh, or 501c3 organization going to repay that. And uh, usually that's a matter of they have to have the, a strong enough balance sheet on their own because even though a state or local government will issue these conduit revenue bonds on behalf of the nonprofit. It's it doesn't have the backing of the state or the local government um, itself, and so the nonprofit has to be strong enough uh, to uh, strong enough balance sheet, have a strong enough, for example, endowment um, that it can access the. Uh, tax and bond markets on its own credit, so to speak. I also want to mention <clears throat> before we can open up to the panel to uh, for further discussions or about uh, tax and bonds as a financing tool, uh, one other option that was a great um, illustration of that national chart that showed all the voter approved uh, initiatives for uh, children and youth. And I would say that uh, we work with um, states and local governments around the country. And at the state level, there is uh, always within the state budgets uh, bonds that are issued for um, child uh, children's funding educational purposes and if you can get part of um, a state's capital budget that you can get the state to issue the bonds on say beh on behalf of a uh, a tribe's youth project that's very much something that i would encourage you to look at likewise if you can be part of a local government um, bond authorization where the local government goes to the voters and is going to issue bonds focused on children's and youth projects and the capital facilities uh, to uh, house those projects, providing kind of the in-kind support that there was a good slide on earlier 
that's another a great way where the nonprofit doesn't have to have its own balance sheet or you don't have to use the tribe's balance sheet and you can still um, provide uh, funding for um, uh, children and youth uh, programs. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, happy to have further discussion, Courtney, or questions or discussion by the panel or uh, address questions from the uh, our audience. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I believe we have two more funding sources to get through. And then we'll move into the panel discussion, but just echoing what Kristen had put into the chat, um, that if you have any, any questions that came up about bonds or one of the other sources we've covered so far, you can feel free to throw those into the Q&A and we'll do our best to get to them in the panel discussion. I wanted to hit on community development financial institutions or CDFIs. They provide grants, loans, and technical assistance to low income and low wealth people in communities. Uh, there are about 70 native CDFIs, which are those in which 50% of the population that they serve identifies as Native American. Um, and they support a range of different needs from housing to food and nutrition, even facilities uh, construction. If you're not familiar with the native CDFI network, it's definitely a resource I encourage you all to check out. Um, on their site, they have a map that shows which of the 50 states there's a native CDFI. Um, they also have a few other resources that go through the types of services and programming that they tend to offer. Uh, so it could be really helpful if you're looking to explore the types of things that um, are accessible through a CDFI. One way that I've seen them support children and youth is specifically in financial literacy and education. So the two CDFIs that I included here, um, they both work in the K through 12 space and offer different types of programming that teaches young kids about the importance of budgeting, savings, asset building, et cetera. Um, You'll have these slides at the end. So if you wanted to follow up on these two particular examples, you could otherwise um, the native CDFI network will be able to connect you with those other ones that are also doing different types of programming to support children and youth. And then the last one, um, last funding source we'll be covering our community benefit agreements. So these are private agreements between a community group, and that can be a government. It could also be a local nonprofit. Um, and they essentially make an agreement with a developer, and that outlines how a proposed project is going to benefit a community. Um, these projects are ones that tend to be pretty large scale. So a lot of the examples I've come across, you see CBAs being negotiated when there are things like stadium development or um, buildings or complexes being built. Um, so this may not be a guaranteed option in some places, depending on the development in your area. But I think there is a lot of potential um, to negotiate a beneficial agreement uh, for kids if it does end up being an option for you. I did come across an example out of New Mexico in which a tribal nation, a state government, and a conservation organization um, negotiated a CBA over a water agreement. Um, it was an Apache tribe that um, they signed a water agreement with the New Mexico Interstate Stream Commission, um, and that allowed the Stream Commission to lease water from them. Of course, the commission is going to benefit because they have access to water that they can now promote water security throughout the region. Um, and then the tribe is able to take some revenue that they had from the water lease agreement and then funnel that back into the tribe. That agreement was reached really early this year, so I haven't seen any major updates on to how the tribe is planning to use um, that specific revenue yet, but it is definitely a promising example in that we are seeing CBAs be used by tribes. Um, there are also some examples we have of CBAs being used for child and youth serving purposes as well. 
I know in the city of Boston, there was an agreement reached between a hotel developer in the city and the hotel developer provided a few hundred thousand dollars worth of revenue for the city to distribute to youth organizations. Um, so that is one example of, of how that could be used for um, a purpose surrounding kids. Um, Sarai, that is all that I have for me. Um, I think it's a good time to transition to the Q&A. Thank you. Okay, so we'll just take that down and we'll have all of our panelists up for the Q&A. So before we get started with our um, our panel discussion, I just want to address, there was one question in the Q&A, and I think this one would be for Alvin, unless anybody has any ideas. What would you recommend for pilot programs for initiating youth workforce development and partnerships targeting career exposure using mentorship as a means to deter dropout? Do you recommend local business chambers of commerce? So it's pilot programs for initiate, initiating youth workforce development and partnerships. So Alvin, while you think about what your answer to that is, I'm gonna uh, stall and give a more gen generic <laughs> answer. And then okay. you give a more uh, specific to your field answer. But um, Sarai, I think people should first, you know, ideally start by, by looking at some of the low hanging fruit around American Rescue Plan funding, which we talked about in the previous webinar. I think they also could look to that federal um, funding stream tool that we're going to be releasing in you know, the next couple of months here, where you could sort by youth mentoring and see every federal funding stream that exists to support that particular type of service. Um, so first, starting with some of those low-hanging fruit things that, I mean, federal grants are not necessarily low-hanging fruit. <laughs> it comes with many, many different hoops to jump through, as we all know. But, but I think there are some things that are, are in place that you could go to as a starting point. And then Alvin, I'm sure you have some creative idea for them. Well, I'm trying to understand the question in the context of this, this uh, webinar. So I think those are great answers, Elizabeth, in terms of potential funding. It also seems like, um, and I'm getting your name correct, Shakira is the one who posed the question. Um, that you're also talking about sort of a programmatic approach. And I, I do think it, it's interesting that you're mentioning business chambers of commerce. Uh, in New Mexico, at least, there are ample opportunities of employers that are interested in providing not only mentorships, but um, paid internships, um, opportunities to young people, including to Native youth. Um, you know, we have tribes that have developed very robust programs for this, and we have others that are partnering with organizations like in New Mexico, there's one called Future Focus Education, which reached out to me yesterday about potentially placing some interns here in, in our foundation. So I do think um, it, it, chambers of commerce vary, I think, in terms of their degree of interest in this. Some have an interest, so it wouldn't be a bad idea to reach out. But I also think um, you know, depending on where you're working, tribes have 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 connections to particular providers um, in terms of you know businesses, tribally owned businesses, suppliers um, that could potentially offer opportunities, including tribal businesses themselves or native organizations. So, um, I think I mean I'm happy to put my email in the chat because this could be a longer conversation about how we support these efforts in tribes, but I hope some of that was helpful. Thank you. So we have another question. Uh, it's about tax exempt bonds. Are child care facilities considered essential government services for tax exempt bonds? And what, what are some considerations that people have to think about when they think that way or are thinking about tax exempt bonds for child care facilities? Uh, thanks, Sarai, and, and thank you, Elka, for your, your question. Um, in most cases, the answer is yes. Uh, child care facilities uh, should constitute an essential governmental function, particularly uh, if they primarily serve educational, um, recreational, or other purposes of that sort. Um, Issues to be aware of that can complicate it would be if you have a private party involved in, say, for example, leasing the facility to provide those services, 
um, you'd have to be mindful of what the private activity uh, bond rules require. Um, another example would be, let's say the facility is like a, I mean, to, to put a very commercial spin on it, like a fun zone in the tribal casino. That's probably closer to the line, and that's you know um, really serving primarily a commercial purpose rather than a, an educational or recreational purpose. Um, but it's a facts and circumstances inquiry. Uh, but the, I would say generally, uh, child and youth services and the facilities that that serve them would constitute an essential governmental function. Doug, anything to add there? No, I would I would agree with those comments, and you know I would uh, mention that those they have been done for quite a long period of time. Townsend and I <coughs> worked on one for the Confederated, Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs. Uh, was actually the first bond issue that they ever did in the early 1990s. Uh, was for an early childhood uh, center that continues to be used. Uh, by the by the tribe. And I think all those issues that Townsend identified as challenges, in most cases, uh, working closely with your uh, bond lawyers for the tribe, you can figure out ways to structure around those so that you can uh, use tax exempt bonds for, for those purposes. But appreciate the excellent question. Also for uh, for Townsend and Doug, how would some a child or youth advocate or somebody that's interested in doing one of these projects, how would they start? Would they, who would they start with to get the information that they need going forward? I would say I, I'm assuming that the, the the child services or youth advocate would is a part of uh, the the tribal government, the tribal administration, something like that. If they're an outside party. Um, no, then, we're just talking about inside parties. Okay, yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna say it's a little more difficult if, if it's an outside mm -hmm. party, but if it's an inside party, I think the, what you, where you would start with um, probably first and foremost is with um, kind of what are the tribes uh, identified, what, what priorities has tribal council identified as uh, those that most need funding, most need attention, and will serve the broadest population. And assuming you fall within that, then obviously work with the tribal agency, department, division, whatever that handles that. But if you want to start talking about, you know, borrowing for a particular facility, I think the, the good sources of information would be your bankers, um, lawyers, uh, that are knowledgeable in how these facilities get financed. Uh, there are financial advisors that provide this service, um, so that there are there are a number of professionals that have that have done this that you could reach out to and say, "Here's what we're thinking of doing. Any ideas as to how this might work in the most efficient manner?" And then just get some suggestions, get some ideas, and then begin to narrow down sort of what your your possibilities are. Thank and you. I would uh, just <clears throat> following up on that good question, um, feel feel free to reach out to Townsend or I if people on the call have questions and happy to put you in touch with those financial advisors and banks who have experience working with tribal governments and uh, on these type of projects and who under, kind of understand the landscape and the key uh, considerations in terms of successfully getting a project done. Happy, happy to uh, dialogue with people on those topics. I would make one more point, which is to reemphasize a point Doug made in his presentation, which is if, if there's a way you can get the state to pay for that, or if you can take advantage of state or local funding, by all means, make sure you're aware of those opportunities because that'll save you time and money. How do you become aware of those opportunities? Is there a special website where those are posted or uh, I, wish, I wish it were that simple. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we call Doug yeah. And yeah. 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 <laughs> work work work. Yeah. If you're you're talking about state or local government, you need to be tied into the, the lobbyists and advocates. I'm sure Elizabeth, you know um 
those it's you know state to state in terms of who uh, has the right with the ear of the right legislators and committees and so forth that can help help make that happen. But happy to happy to explore that further with people. Thank you. I wanted to shift the conversation back to Alvin. You had mentioned when you were speaking earlier that there were there were some other uh, there was some other information that you wanted to share. And then I also wanted to talk a little bit about where foundations, if you know any of this, or if you have any ideas where foundations are headed in terms of funding child and youth programs and their priorities in funding um, children and youth um, programs. Okay, let me see if I can do this in one and a half minutes. Um, so, so our foundation, one of the partnerships that we have is with eight of the, the tribes here in the North, and we're now expanding to additional tribes. And we have, we kind of manage a working group of their early childhood um, directors. And so we provide direct funding to them through our foundation. We also help make connections for them with other foundations in our region. But really, ultimately, what's necessary is to help them to get access to the resources that are coming through our state government. So tribes were also very active in advocating for the establishment of what became the Early Childhood um, Education and Care Department, ECECD. And that department in its statute includes an assistant secretary for Indian Affairs, similar to our public education department. And our partnership, and we have a team here at the foundation that is focused on this, has been working to make sure that there are a variety of state programs that were not designed to either be eligible for tribes or tribal entities or to make the process easy. And really breaking down those barriers is something that we all have to invest a lot of time and effort. Again, as a, a former cabinet secretary of Indian Affairs, I spend the majority of my time working with my counterparts in the cabinet to help them understand, number one, tribes should be eligible entities because they are state citizens. They live, may live on tribal land or off tribal land, but they should have equal access to state resources. And we need to make those mechanisms more available. We also have to address it in statute because there are some statutes that actually exclude native organizations, tribally controlled schools, BIE funded schools. Um, and so this is all to me around an issue of equity. So, and I think, you know, webinars like this are fantastic, but we always have to be attentive to the policy side of this because there are barriers even in terms of federal funding. We know that there are vast inequities when it comes to WIOA funding, for example, from what flows through states to what actually goes directly to tribes. So there's, there's a lot of work to be done here. Um, philanthropy can play a role, but really the best role is to help position tribes um, to access federal and state resources and to, um, uh, and to be able to break down those policy barriers. Thank you, Alvin. Alvin, I want to be cognizant and I want to be respectful of everybody's time. We have one minute left for this webinar and I, I really don't want to go over, but I just want to remind everybody to, you have my contact information uh, and we are, we do have as a part of this threefold of our vision for this organization, we are wanting to do a pilot project uh, to do a cost model with the tribe. And so I'll be reaching out to all the participants and answering any questions about that application. And thank you again so much to our panelists for taking the time to come and have these important discussions and, and topics of conversation. And Elizabeth, do you wanna uh, leave us with? with no, any I want to reinforce the, the idea that we are looking for um, folks who are, are interested in working with us on this cost model, model piece because Again, I mentioned it at the very beginning, we often go in asking for what we think we can get versus going in with a real sense of what it's gonna cost to do this work well. And, and so that's what this um, pilot project is about. And we wanna support a tribe in doing that, so. Thank you. Thank you, Alvin. Thank you so much. Thank you, Doug and Jennifer and Townsend for, for all of this great information. We appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.